Good morning. Happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers with us today and for everyone in the room that has a mother. Happy Mother's Day to you as well. I picked this up off the ground when I came up because sometimes isn't this just Mother's Day and mothershood. For so those moms in the room that only got a stem, I'm pretty sure you're allowed to come down later and get a whole one intact. But I'm like, sometimes, you know, we're talking about contentment today. This is how it feels right there. So if we have not met, my name is Erica. I started attending Fox River back in 2001. You're allowed to do the public math. Keep it to yourself. I was in college then. My husband and I got married shortly thereafter, and we've been raising our three daughters here at Fox River ever since. And now they are all teenagers. And people have been warning me since they were born, just wait until they're all teenagers. And they are. And it is awesome. And it is so much fun. So don't be afraid. It can be really, really good. When they were really little, however, a new ministry here at Fox River started called Mom Time. It currently meets Tuesday mornings and Wednesday nights, and it's a group for moms to come together, to get to know one another, to celebrate alongside each other, to struggle alongside each other, to know we're not alone. And there's a speaker, and there's a time of community, and about a month and a half ago, I was asked to speak at Mom Time, and I spoke on Contentment, contentment in motherhood and contentment just in life. So here's the irony about this whole contentment talk, because I actually thought I was supposed to speak on it like three separate times throughout the year. So I was prepared in the fall, and they're like, no, not this week. I was like, oh. And then I thought it was in January, and I was prepared. They're like, no, not now either. So I actually spoke like last month. I was like, God, that's funny. Like, have you been wanting me to work on my contentment like all year? I mean, I have a calendar. I can write down when I'm supposed to be speaking and be prepared, but for whatever reason, he has had me on a journey of contentment over the last year, maybe to come and talk to you today. So there are some things in our lives that really can kill contentment pretty quick. Do you know what contentment is? Like, how do we define contentment? Is a life of contentment even possible? I mean, the dictionary would define it as a state of mind, like a place where we live in our head. Ladies in the room, how much time do we spend up here in our head? A lot of time. And contentment would be a state of mind of satisfaction, of happiness and peace. You may have even experienced a moment or two of contentment in your life. Maybe a whole day maybe even a season, but it just never feels long enough. It always feels like it ends and that it can be fleeting. I like to think back to Christmas time when the tree is lit and the house is dark and you get to sit in the ambiance of the tree and you're like, life is good. This is satisfaction and peace. Maybe even when you get up early in the morning before your children to try to have some quiet time and sit with your coffee or your tea and your Bible and you're like, oh, I'm going to just have a very peaceful moment here. But if you're anything like me when my kids were little, if I got up early to try to have just a little bit of alone time, for whatever reason, they would be getting up earlier that day. And I was like, you just killed my contentment. Contentment killers. But if I'm honest, I can kill my contentment by myself real easy. Like staying up too late the night before because I just need a break from life. Like I'll said to my children, I've punched the mom clock. I'm out. Go find your dad. Don't come out of your room. You know, like all the things like I'm off duty. You stay up too late. You binge watch. You're on your phone. And now you're tired the next morning because you stayed up late. And now you're running behind Has this ever happened to anybody in the room? Like, am I alone here or is this just me? And nothing works well when you're late, especially if you're trying to get toddlers out of the house. That'll get rid of your contentment like that because they can never have both shoes on. One, I don't know why there's only ever one shoe at the door when it's time to leave, but contentment can be killed for me very easily. I can do it all by myself, to myself. And God has been challenging me, well, what are these big issues? What causes your contentment to be so fleeting? And I think we've experienced most of them for all of us in this room. And I know we're honoring mothers today, but I think this really is a message for all of us. Do you want to live a life of contentment? Doesn't that sound good? Like, it sounds great. But why do we struggle so much with it? I can tell you one of the ways I struggle with it is uh, comparison, I don't think we have to talk much about comparison. I think we know that comparison as a whole, not super healthy. Yet, I think we're all really good at it. It's easy to look at other people's houses 
or their cars or their clothes. I may have already looked at a couple sweaters this morning and was like, ooh, cute. Do you know what I mean? Like we can compare our relationships, maybe our spouses, possibly our children. You know, when you have that friend that says, yes, my child is reading chapter books by age two, and you're like, oh, that's so good. And then you look at yours. And they're like, do you know blue? Do you know the color blue? Like, are we past colors, right? Like we compare our children and their development. We compare all of the things. And it's just not healthy. What it actually does is it makes us look out into the world and the things that are going on in culture and then turn and look in on ourselves. Like, oh, I don't have that. I want that. And do you know what happens when we look at ourselves too much? We become depressed. When we just focus inward, it has a very negative consequence on that state of mind. It kills contentment very quickly. In 2 Corinthians 10, Paul is defending his ministry to the Corinthian church. And what he says is very telling when it comes to comparison. He says, not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves. But when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. Some translations say they are in foolishness. So when we compare ourselves to others, when we measure how we're doing as moms based on how other moms appear to be doing, when we compare our circumstances to others, our jobs, our money, our travel to others, it is foolishness. How are we feeling about ourselves this morning? Does anybody else struggle with comparison like I struggle with comparison? It kills our contentment. How about control? It's another one that I can really struggle with. We all like to control what we think we can control, right? A couple weeks ago, Pastor Guy in his current series in Deep Happiness, he told us, hey, you really can only control about 10% of the things that you think you're in control of. And honestly, some days I think that's awfully generous because we're really not in control of a whole lot at all. When I talked about contentment at mom time about a month ago, I, I was asking the question and I was prepared for dialogue. What are the things that you try to control in your life? And I was ready to hear finances, my relationships, people, my reputation, my children. And instead, the very first thing that came out instantly was everything. And I just had to laugh. I was like, well, very honest. I, yeah, I think we do try to control as much as possible. And the thing is, we just don't have a whole lot of control, if at all. Job 42, 2 says, I know that you can do all things. This is Job talking to God. He said, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. God has a plan and he has a purpose and it can't be thwarted. He's going to do it regardless of us and how we interact and what we try to control. He's still going to do it. And I don't know about you, but that sounds exhausting to me to try to fight against the purpose that God might already have in place. So when my oldest was getting into grade school, you know, it was time for her to have a thing. Our poor firsts, they're like our total parenting experiments, aren't they? Like, we don't know what we're doing, but, you know, we're looking at other people, figuring it out as we go. And it's like, you need to have a thing. Don't all kids need to have a thing to excel at, to spend their time doing, to be not at home doing, right? So I tried to put her in like all the things to find it. I was like, we tried swim, we tried dance, gymnastics, that didn't go very well. So we went to rhythmic gymnastics and then we tried soccer, too much running I was told. So I'm like, okay, chess club, boring. I was like, rock climbing. You guys, we like tried all the things. That lasted a little while and it was just kind of like, um, no, I don't wanna do those and you're like, hmm. I tried, like, I tried to, like, control the heck out of this thing. Let's fast forward to middle school, and you have to, like, schedule your classes. She's like, Mom, I signed up for band. I was like, but honey, you don't play an instrument. You can't sign up for band if you don't play an instrument. She's like, but I play the recorder. And I was like, ugh, don't they all play the recorder? The thing needs to go away. And she's like, so what instrument is like a recorder? I was like, I don't know, a clarinet. I think your aunt has a clarinet, sign up, I'll go get a clarinet, and okay, fine, be in band. You guys, she started brand new as a seventh grader in band, playing the clarinet. 
By Christmas, she had picked up b the bassoon. By the end of the year, the flute. By eighth grade, the trumpet, the piano, the guitar, and the ukulele. And I'm sitting here going, huh, so music is your thing. <laughs> I didn't try that one. <laughs> Interesting. And now she's going to go on to college next year for a music degree, hopes for that to be her profession. And guess how much control I had over it, everybody? None. Nothing. God had his plan. And it was not thwarted. He and her, they figured it out. And not for my lack of trying to control that thing. How are you with control? What do you try to control? Because there's nothing more defeating than trying to control and control and make something happen. And then it fails. And then you're just exhausted. And you're like, well, that was a waste of my energy. We, a lot of times, spend time fighting against God and his plan. The question is, how are we fighting alongside him? What can we be doing differently to join him in his plan? It can be really hard to know the difference. And that is where prayer comes in. We're like, God, am I fighting against you or am I fighting with you? Show me. Because I don't have time to waste on fighting plans that are just going to fail. Kill my contentment for sure. Do we want to talk about expectations? I mean... That can really kill contentment. Expectations, while aren't, they aren't wrong or bad in and of themselves, I think we just need to understand our expectations fully. If we think about it and we're honest, expectations are 100% selfish. We don't intend them to be always, but that's how they're just developed. It's how we were raised, what we experience, what we know, what we expect to continue on, how we expect other people to behave. I mean, the litmus test of whether or not your expectations might uh, be selfish would be like, um, have you ever said, I shouldn't have to tell you. You should just know. I shouldn't have to say this out loud. I shouldn't have to remind you. You should just do the things, right? Like, these are all red flags of like, oh, this is my processing and what I'm assuming you're just going to do because... <laughs> That's the way I do it, so it's the right way to do it, so you really should just do it that way, right? Like, we have these expectations in our relationships. Now, expectations in relationships can be a very good thing. If they're communicated and we talk about it and you sit down and you have dialogue, you compromise, you come to an agreement, I mean, this is called relationship. That's how you do it. You have conversation. It's very, very healthy. However, if you have expectations in your head and you keep them right here, and you project them onto people in your relationships without ever telling them, hmm, that's not real safe. All you're doing is building walls between you and somebody else that they don't even know exist. And you're like, oh, they're not doing all the things. And let's be honest, a lot of times as people, we're just clueless. We don't know what you want. We don't know what you're thinking. You're going to have to spell it out for us sometimes. Are your expectations communicated? Are they realistic and are they fair? Moms, women in the room, how are your expectations of yourself? Because we live in a Pinterest world where we think we're going to be amazing moms before we have children. And then we get into it and we're like, oh, this is hard. I struggle with completely unrealistic expectations of myself. Is there anybody else? I'm like, I should be able to do this and this and this and this and this. And by the end of the day, I'm like, I'm just going to sit down. Like... I can't do them. Forget it. What was I thinking? So many of them are just completely unrealistic. And when I have these expectations of myself up here and then I don't meet them, my contentment, my internal dialogue is like, girl, you have got to get your act together. Like, when are you going to learn to be disciplined? And you know, your emotions can tank pretty quick and spiral all the way down. Who wants to live there and stay there? I don't. I would love to live a life that is more marked by contentment than irritation with myself and the world around me and the people in my relationships, right? And there are things that we can do to practice contentment. We have to learn it. I consider it like the flip side of the patience coin, right? Like if you pray for patience, we do know not to do that, right? Because the second you pray for patience, God's going to give you all the opportunities in the world to practice your patience. Contentment's a little like that. God, help me to be content. I'm like, whoa. Be careful. That's a loaded prayer. This is something we practice. We improve upon and we get better at as we go along. And one of those ways that can help us is our gratitude. 
We talk about gratitude a lot around Thanksgiving. Get a gratitude journal. Number them one through 100. The first 10 off the top are pretty easy, right? Our homes, our family, our house, our pets, our dogs, our kids, like all the things, right? And then as we keep going further down, it starts to get a little bit more difficult, right? Like, huh, now I really got to think. I'm at like number 40. What else do I got? Right? Like, it takes some practice. It takes some work to really look for the blessings in the moment that God has given us. About three years ago, I was in a small group here at church, and we read a book called Idol of the Heart. Very eye-opening, exceptionally convicting. If you're into that sort of pain, you should probably read it. I think you'll love it. But one of the things that it pointed out to me was that some of my behaviors that I've done my whole life were indeed what I call an idol of next and an idol of tomorrow. I've moved through from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, making my checklists, flying through them. I mean, it's great and efficient in the workplace, not so much in raising a family and being aware of what's going on around you every single day. Because I had this belief that if I could get out of this stage and into the next one, then things will be better. Man, if you could just sleep through the night, if you could be potty trained, when you're potty trained, life will be easy. When you can all get yourself in the car and buckle yourself, life will be better. It'll just be easier. How many times are you like, is it bedtime yet? I need this day to be over. As if tomorrow holds some magic promise of peace and contentment and ease. And I learned over and over, I was like, huh, every time I get to that next stage where I thought things would be better, it's not. It's got its own issues. If we can just get to the next job, the next pay raise, after a vacation, if I lose the next 10 pounds, if we get here or there in the next place, then it'll be better. It never happened. Every time I get there, I'm still struggling with that same contentment problem because I'm not living in the moment looking at the things around me that to be grateful for. To get down to that number 100 and be like, oh, my favorite fluffy socks in the middle of winter. Or the quiet of the house when everyone is asleep so I can sit and be still. Or for me right now in the spring, the sound of the frogs in the spring. These things that I'm really grateful for. Every moment that we are going through, there's something to be grateful for. And this is something I have to keep practicing every day because I'm still always looking ahead for the next thing. And you know what happens when you live in that space? Is you look back and you're like, how did we get here? How, how is it that my oldest is going to graduate high school and go off to college and now my home isn't going to be the same anymore? You look back and you feel like you missed a ton because for me, living in the moment is very difficult. Some of you may not have that problem. Some of you might be very, very good about living in the moment. Some of you might actually struggle with living in the past. But I think for all of us, we can work so much on trying to be present, looking for the things to be grateful for right here and right now. Even if in your circumstances, in your situations, the only thing that you can be grateful for is the breath in your lungs. David had said in Psalms that I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. Because you know what? Sometimes gratitude feels like a sacrifice. Sometimes it's just hard. But it helps us grow and lean in to our contentment. Living life with perspective, the perspective on God, on the big picture of what's going on around us, that God has created us all here for a purpose. He has put humankind here on earth for the purpose of coming into relationship with him, to know him, to experience his goodness, to accept his saving grace for the future of our souls in eternity, but also in living every single day on this earth in a place of contentment, of joy and peace. We talked about the goodness and the faithfulness of God this morning we were singing. And our job then, our purpose then is to go and spread the goodness. That's the big picture. That's why we're here. And if we can back up and if we can take our eyes off of our circumstances and off of our lives and look out and see the big picture and the purpose, like, I'm here to be spreading the goodness of God, to be living in gratitude that helps build that contentment because things aren't then always just about us. That purpose of spreading God's goodness, it starts in our homes. It starts with our children. We model so much of this gratitude. We model of living this life on purpose in our homes. 
And you know what, sometimes it doesn't always work out the way that we had hoped. Sometimes our children grow up and maybe walk away from the church and they're not now spreading the goodness of the Lord because we're trying to spread to others so that they spread to others. But guess what, there are always people in our lives to disciple, to share the goodness of God with. If you came to Christianity late in life, you might be feeling like, I didn't have the opportunity to tell my kids when they were little. This is a good reminder for all of us that we're not in control of the outcome. That's God's job. Our job is to live on purpose in spreading the goodness, plant the seeds, and let him do the rest. And lastly, if we want to really be content in this life, if we want to have this state of satisfaction of peace that sounds all too amazing to have every day, it requires the strength of the Lord the power of the Holy Spirit. So there's a verse that's probably very familiar to a lot of you. It's Philippians 4.13, and I'm going to have you read it with me. I'm sure we've seen it on shirts, on mugs, on signs. Let's read it together. It says what? It says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yes. I mean, we like this verse. I like this verse. I want to do all the things. I've got a lot to do, and I just need the strength. I need God to like strengthen me. I got to tap into that to get all the things done. Here's the thing. Do we know that this verse, which I didn't know until a couple years ago, is talking about contentment? I'm going to back up and start in verse 11 for you, and we're going to, I'll read this for you. Paul says, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul's talking about contentment. He's saying, I have learned the secret of being content. He's had to practice. This has been a process. He has learned how to be content through abundance, through plenty. We don't often think about having to be content when we have all the things, but honestly... That's a lot of times where contentment is the hardest, in abundance, in need, in want. I mean, he's talking about basic things like there were times he didn't have food and he learned how to be content. How? What's the secret? I can do this through him who strengthens me. My contentment has nothing to do with my circumstances. It has everything to do with the strength of God in me and in my life. How are we doing Tapping into the strength of God, walking in the spirit, depending on him daily and fully for everything we need, for all of our basic needs. Are we content in the plenty and are we content when we lack? This is a process. We improve, we grow, we practice. We have to like cultivate contentment. It doesn't just get dropped in our lap and poof, it's done. We fight for this, knowing that through gratitude, having the right perspective, but depending on the power of the Holy Spirit, that is where contentment comes. You guys, this life can be scary. Parenting can be a, a bit scary and challenging. I mean, think of the day you drove home from the hospital with your first child in the car. It made you realize why people say baby on board in their window. Cause you're like, this is scary. They go to kindergarten and you send them out into the world just a little bit, it can be scary. <laughs> they go to middle school. That is scary. High school, they become adults. They move on. They make their own choices and you sit back and you watch. It can be scary. You may have lost your child. You may have lost your mother. She might have gone on before you. Your child might have walked away from the Lord. This is hard, scary stuff. This is life. This is humanity. It is hard and it is scary. And who doesn't want to try to get through this life content? I do. Could you imagine what it would look like if the people of God, his children, walked out into this world content and peaceful, regardless of their circumstances? I think that would speak volumes to the world around us. I think it would speak volumes to one another here, that we could encourage one another on this journey to contentment and remembering that starts with our surrender to God and dependence on him daily because we can't do this ourselves. And if you have yet to experience the saving grace of God that is required for contentment, his spirit and his strength, I invite you today as we move into a time of prayer to do the same in surrender your life to him now, to depend on him 
daily. This is our Christian walk. So we surrender and we depend on him and his strength for our contentment, for our peace, for our joy, for our relationships, for all the things that he has for us while we're here on this earth. Will you pray with me? Father God, I just thank you for all the mothers in the room. I thank you so much for the gift of motherhood and the role that you have created for women to play. We are so grateful for our children, for each blessing that you give us every day, but God, it can be so hard to stay there, to stay content and say, stay focused on you. Lord, we ask for the reminders to be grateful in every moment, no matter how hard. God, we pray for your strength to help us remember, to see the big picture, to look up off of ourselves, our circumstances and onto you and walk through this world content. Lord, I lift up all of the hurting hearts here to you today. May they know your comfort and peace as they celebrate later today. And for those seeking you today, Lord, as they draw near to you, I pray that you draw near to them. God, we praise you for you and who you are. May we, may we walk out of here today as a people content, that we are surrendered, that we are dependent and resting in satisfaction and peace in the strength that you give us. And we pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.